What's going on? Welcome to Unapologetically Black Male, where we talk about surviving the stigmas, standards, and systems. I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, on behalf of my co-host, EJ Stewart, myself, Dwayne Pate, and our sponsor, Jay Pope and Associates, we want to thank you for joining us today. We have a great guest on for, for you today. But once again, um, our sponsor is J. Pope and Associates. So if you are in need of in, in the Baltimore or DMV area, you're in need of some therapeutic services, counseling, individual couples, make sure you reach out. The link will be um, in the show notes. But once again, thank you for joining us today. And uh, we have a, br a brother by the name of Van Brooks, who's going to share a little bit about himself, tell us about his background, where he's from, you know, and a little bit about his story about where what has gotten him to where he is now. So, Van, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, and you can just kind of uh, give us a background about you, uh, about you. I said you. Here we go. <laughs> that Baltimore, that Baltimore, come out you real quick. <laughs> yeah. All right, go ahead, man. It's on you, man. Man, look, I appreciate the opportunity of, of coming on and sharing my story, man. Um, so a little bit about myself again. I'm Van Brooks, born and raised in West Baltimore. Um, start, you know, family from humble beginnings. I'm the youngest of five, which is going to be important. Um, but youngest of five and all older sisters, man. So <laughs> only boy and I'm the youngest. Um, but, you know, the 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 story is um, honestly, man, like I said, humble beginnings. But being the youngest, my parents were um, able to afford to go to private schools. Mm -hmm. And so I went to private schools all my life, whereas my, my, my siblings didn't. And so literally from um, elementary school, I went to Father Charles, which was St. Peter's Clavier, which is up in Sandtown. And then from there, once I graduated there, I went to Loyola Blakefield on Towson uh, for six through 12. And while I was at Blakefield, I became a three sport athlete. And I became uh, really good at football. I started coming into my own in, on the football field and I started getting looks from, the, you know, different D1 colleges. And so that's, you know, that was the trajectory that I was I was on of going to D1 and then hopefully make it to the league. Uh, one of the things my parents used to always say to me was they're sending me to school to get an education, not to play sports. Uh, they used to always say to me, what happens if you put all your, you know, put all your eggs in one basket, you drop that basket, then you have nothing else to go for you because you haven't been planning for those things. But at the time I was 16 years old, beginning of my junior year. And it was like, man, you see the things that I'm capable of doing on the field. You see the physique that I have. Nothing's going to happen. Football is going to change my life. And it did change my life, just not in the way that I expected it. Right. And so, uh, my junior year. September 25th, 2004, went for a routine tackle up against one of our uh, big, big, I wouldn't call him a rival, but it was a big game, Georgetown Prep. Went in for, you know, a tackle, something I've done um, time and time again. And uh, my head collided with the runner's knee, and I broke my neck in two places. And so laying on that field, I didn't think anything of it, honestly, because I, up until that point, I had broken, man, I didn't broken. 10 bones up to that point and just throughout my career playing sports. And so I knew something had broke. Right. But for me, it's like, eh, I'm going to bounce back from this. Like I did everything else. Like we good. Mm -hmm. My body started tingling. Like I was um, like, I was like, like a stinger, right? Well, we call it a stinger, but you know, when a body part falls asleep, that tingling sensation you get, mm -hmm. I did that a lot. Right. I, I was a hitter. So I, I played safety. So, I man, coming in, putting the body on the line, that was nothing new. If I didn't get a stinger a game, I won. I won balling up. Right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and so that was just like my mentality. So when my body was like that. I was like, I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm going to lay here for a quick second. I'm going to get up and back to the game. But I couldn't get up and it felt like I was levitating. Right. And so basically I heard my mother. I saw that, you know, my mother was on the field. Now, the crazy story about that <laughs> with my mother being on the field. So when I first started playing football, literally my first game, we out drill park with the, at the bowl mm -hmm. going down out there. Right. And uh, I was playing running back. I got tackled at the bottom of the pile. And I hear my mother saying, get off my son, get off my son. Right. <laughs> when I when the pile getting light, man, my mother's like pulling people off me like, <laughs> oh, man, oh, God, man, listen. You can't ever do that again. Like you can't never do that again. And so hearing her on the field was like, ah, something, something's really wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Something, something's really wrong. And so um, 
you know, they, they, of course, they go into their procedures. Can, can I feel this? Can I feel that? Cut my, my face mask off, doing all that stuff. The paramedics came, and I overheard one of the paramedics say he broke his neck. Now, again, I'm young, I'm 16, naive, not really, don't know nothing about the world, don't know nothing about nothing, but I think I know it all, right? Mm -hmm. you know, when you're that age. And I say, man, this dude don't know what he's talking about because I always thought that if you broke your neck, you would die, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm like, man, I'm living. What, what this dude talking about? I'm talking. I just can't move at the moment. Um, got medevac down to shock trauma. Mm. And when I woke up, I was paralyzed from the neck down, unable to do anything for myself. Mm. Like nothing. I wasn't breathing on my own. Couldn't move. Couldn't talk. I could move my head side to side, but that was it. And uh, I overheard the doctors talking to my parents. My, they, my, they, my parents' back was towards me. So they, mm. never, knew, they never knew that I woke up. And they, I heard them saying um, he's going to be like that for the rest of his life. So start to make accommodations for him. Mm. And um, I mean, as you, as you can only imagine, hearing that you're devastated. Uh, and all I could literally, all I could do is literally cry. Like that's it. I couldn't talk. Right. And that's where that's where the the, the, the new journey began, man. That's where the mm. new journey began. Yeah, man. So that that, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why, I'm, that's why I pause there, man, because it, it, gets, it gets deeper. Yeah. It gets, deeper, I, it gets better, though. It gets better. A, absolutely. And I think that's, that, that's that's a part of the story. And that's a part yeah. of the struggle. Um, And just kind of, you know, uh, you know, managing through that, because oftentimes you'll see people like that. You know, you'll see it on you'll see somebody get injured or get paralyzed. But you don't know the story or you don't yeah. know what they talk. You don't know the struggle that they go through in that process. All you know is that they got hurt. And you might hear a story about them, you know, every so often now, down the block. But if you're not really paying attention or if you're not really focused on that person, you don't know, like, the day the day to day struggles that they have to go through yeah. just to kind of make it and just kind of, you know, be positive about life. Yeah. Yeah, man. No, it, it, it's definitely a struggle, man. Um, I say that was the darkest time of my life, mm -hmm. like the darkest time of my life. And um, it, it honestly, it wasn't it wasn't because. Like, so physically, right? Physically, mm -hmm. I, I can deal with anything. Like, tell us today, I, I've always been that way. A high tolerance for pain. Mm -hmm. I, I, I I had the mental fortitude of literally, like, how I got through the hospital a lot of times, I would tell myself I was on the beach. Like, literally, I was like, man, look, you on the beach, you chilling, you're going to bounce back. That was just me trying to take myself out of the reality of it. But, man, it, it, had, gotten, it had gotten really bad to the point of um, I tried to give up. Mm -hmm. And that's when i realized truly realized how powerful the the mind your mind is right because mm -hmm. one of those things you know how somebody anything you you, you put your mind to you can achieve and this and the third being paralyzed unable to move and mm -hmm. saying i'm done with this i'm, I'm i don't want i don't want to do this and i didn't want to do it because i kept seeing the pain of my mother right gotcha. like, like that the seeing my mother going through what she was going through crying and, and the pain in her eyes of seeing her son like that was, mm -hmm. was, was, was devastating to me. Forget my injury for, for I, I, I'm going to be okay. Right. Like physically, right. but the mental part of it wasn't there at that moment. Um, so I tried to give up and when I woke up, my condition was worse than what it was because mm -hmm. I was making a little progress, but my condition was worse than what it was. And my dad, we had like a, a way of communicating without, you know, being able to talk. And he knew it. He knew it. And mm -hmm. he, had, he had his choice words for me. And he left, you know, stormed out the room, left. And um, it's crazy. I didn't find out where he went. We did another interview and he's never talked about it. Like till this mm -hmm. day, I still don't really know much about anything, what he went through outside of. And, and this helped me. And I'll share it um, a little later. But. I, I'm going to say it now, but then I'll get back to it. But he, I asked him, I said, how did you get through it? And he said, one day at a time. Mm. I did what I had to do that day to get through to tomorrow. Mm. Tomorrow was going to be a separate, you know, a different set of challenges. Right. Right. So he, so what I found out though, he went to the bathroom and he said, he went, when he went to the bathroom, the bathroom was immaculate, clean, like super clean. Mm -hmm. He went to the stalls and sat down and cleared his mind, closed the door. And on the back of the door, it said, a man is defeated when he loses. He's defeated when he gives up. Mm. He came back in the room and he said, um, I'm going to tell you, tell you two things. The first thing he said was, God's going to do his part. I'm going to do my part and I need you to do yours. 
Mm. And then follow that up with that quote, a man is defeated when he loses, he's defeated when he gives up. And for me, that literally saved my life. Literally. Mm. From that point moving forward, I told myself, no matter what it was going to take for me to recover, I was going to do it. And I started looking at life as the fourth quarter of a football game. Because all my life of playing sports, I always trained for the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. Like I knew I would be good the first three, but I knew when in tight games, when that fourth quarter rolled around, I need to be better than everyone else. Mm-hmm. So saying that I was preparing for that fourth quarter was preparing me mentally for whatever was going to come my way. Like I, I made that commitment to myself. And, um, you know, at the time they told me I wouldn't be able to graduate on time in my class. None of that. I missed my entire junior year. And I set out to prove everyone wrong. Mm-hmm. I said I would never walk again. I said, "Cool, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to achieve that. Like, I'm gonna not try. I'm gonna walk again. Like all of those things." As soon as I was able to talk, I started taking classes in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, me and my, when I came home from the hospital, I was there for four months. When I came home, I started taking um, classes that summer to make up my junior year. I started actually driving myself back to school my senior year. Graduated on time with my class. The next thing was they said I wouldn't be able to go to college. I graduated from Towson University. Um, after graduating from Towson University, now I was eight years into my injury at that point. And being an athlete at that time, I was literally going to therapy five days a week. Like I'm in that joint, five days a week. My schedule was school, therapy, therapy, school, like, like literally. And so after doing it for so long, I became independent, got a lot back. You know, I'm, I'm living life again, right? I'm living life again. And the weight of people constantly saying to me, why are you still going to therapy? Nothing's changing. Like, you're good. Like, live your life. Why are you still, you know, focusing on that? Mm-hmm. And one day I woke up and um, I, I was in a bad mood, man. I, and, you know, I was like, man, I don't feel like going to therapy. I ain't going today. But I had my habit. It was my routine for eight years where literally I'm jumping up. So long story short, I end up over there and I go in and I tell my therapist, I say, look, I want to try to walk today. And if y'all don't let me try to walk today, I'm done. Like, I ain't, I ain't doing this. Mm-hmm. Man, that, was the, that was the first day I took steps on my own. Mm-hmm. And something else my father used to say to me is, don't quit before the miracle happens. Mm-hmm. Like, because you never know when, when it's there. Like, don't quit before the miracle happens. And I almost gave up. And that miracle happened. And since then, I've been able to walk. Now, I'm still I'm still confined to the wheelchair. Mm-hmm. It's still going to be a long, you know, a very long journey. I'm, 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 I'm a realist, so I know what my journey is. Right. It's going to be long. But I did accomplish that walking again. Mm-hmm. Um, I did accomplish that. And I'm going to continue to work at it until I, until I can get off this chair. Um, that's, that's the ultimate goal, but accomplishing that was the hardest thing I ever had to do in life. Mm. Life is a cakewalk for me. Wow. It has, it has its ups and downs, but nothing's ever going to be as hard as that. So yeah, man, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just speaks to, you know, the, the mentality, like you said, the mind is a powerful thing. And then when you and, and when you can and when you can kind of shape your your trajectory based on what you're thinking about yourself, it kind of pushes you along the way, and, and that's what you use to push yourself, and that's that's tremendous. And I would I want to I want to see like ask did, were there at any point did you like have a therapist or anything like that, or or did this, did you just kind of power through this thing like with the help of your dad and like mom and family? Man, so and this anybody's listening, don't do this, please. So, I, again, being young, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't talk to a therapist because you're crazy. We don't talk to therapists. Right. You, you're, you're crazy if you need to talk to somebody. Therapist came in my room when I was in the hospital and said to me, sir, I want to talk to you about this. Have you contemplated suicide? Mm-hmm. And I said, ma'am, I'm paralyzed. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't get out mm-hmm. of my room and never come back. And she left out the room and I never seen one since. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I say you don't do that is because I fell victim to the stigma. Don't talk to therapists because you're crazy. Mm-hmm. When I really need a therapist and I still see how the trauma shows up in my daily life. 
something it's still it's still there from the the way that I I carry relationships because when I was injured er, literally everyone who I thought was my friend disappeared mm. like you know you that star athlete the hood love you mm -hmm. girls love you mm -hmm. and everybody <laughs> love you right like you, you that man right mm -hmm. when when that meal ticket taken away it's like oh we we gone to the next person and right. that was just such a harsh reality so going through that, I, I didn't talk to nobody about that, right? So that still shows up in how I have my, so a lot of my relationships today. You get mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, um, you know, the the it's just a lot. And so that's why I'm recommending, man, like if you're going through some traumas, is it, talk about it. And I, I eventually did find my relief mm -hmm. um, once I started doing speaking engagements and things like that. Like that became my therapy for me to be like, because I found that there's power and vulnerability. Absolutely. For me getting up there and telling somebody, hey, yes, I, I, I want to live. Yes, these are the traumas that I went through. Yes, these are the things that I still deal with due to those traumas because I didn't talk to someone about that. Don't do what I did. Right. Mm -hmm. That is my therapy, though. Um, and so it kind of at this point is balancing itself out. And I'm also one like I'm a I'm, I'm a realist and I know my flaws and I'm willing to face those things. So mm -hmm. someone called me out on something, I'm going to take note of it. And I'm never the one that's going to deny any of those types of things. I'm going to check myself when I need to. Right. Um, but everyone's not like that. Uh, yep. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I applaud you for even recognizing that the fact that, you know, you had I mean, not, not to say you handled it wrong, but you handled it how what you were, uh, I guess, conditioned to handle. Yeah. You know, because because as, as African-American men or as the culture. You know, it's always been taught like, oh, you know, whatever happens in this house stays in this house. You know, yeah, don't let yeah. it. And if it, if I hear about it, you know, you're going to get in trouble. Yeah. So, you know, it's just kind of acknowledging that, just kind of realizing, all right, you know, I might have handled it differently. I might have handled it, you know, not not the best way, but I understand, you know, how it has helped shape me and encouraging people to kind of, you know, pursue the opposite if yeah. needed. I mean, and, and then you got to understand every, therapy is not for everybody. Yep. Um, and, and sometimes you got to find your own lane like you did. You said the speaking engagements is what helped you um, to kind of release that that uh, and being vulnerable and being transparent. So, you know, I applaud. I definitely applaud you for that. Um, just kind of come to that realization because, uh, you know, it could have been a detriment to you and it could affect you in, in, in many more ways than um, in many more ways than it did. But you, you kind of turned it around and kind of use it for, you know, to kind of be vulnerable and share your story. So, EJ, you. <laughs> I mean, you know, every every time it's like, you know, we do this and I tell, you know, Pate, like, you know, we talk to so many dynamic brothers. It's like it's it's a great thing. We keep finding or we know and we keep highlighting brothers that are really, you know, special. And, you know, the point of this, man, is to highlight you and what you've overcame, you know, what you've overcome, rather, the stigmas, the doubt, you know. I mean, everything that you surmised for me, I already knew. Once you said what happened to you, I already knew what was hitting for it. But my, mine in a much less um, scope. And, you know, I was going to ask you, like, you know, who left you in your corner? And, you know, and then, you know, what I learned in higher education research, you know, that a lot of people don't understand is that when an athlete loses the ability to play sports for whatever reason, it's similar to mourning a death, mm -hmm. you know? So you at a very young age, you lost the closest person you could lose. That wasn't your parents, your children. You lost a part of you mm -hmm. and, you know, to, to persevere through that and to bounce back and to be where you are, you know, whatever flaws or whatever you feel unapologetically to be where you are today, you need, you need to definitely take your hat off way more if you don't you know what i mean and salute yourself you know because that man i mean that is you know it's a powerful thing man and and definitely appreciate you for sharing because somebody needs to hear it yes. absolutely absolutely so i mean you you told us about your story so and where you are and, and it kind of all the things that you get you know that you been, had to deal with to kind of get up to where you are now so yeah. tell us a little bit about like what it is that you're doing now and how, you know, other, you know, I know you talked about the speaking engagement, but give me a couple other things that you're kind of invested in. I know you talked about the after school program. So kind of yeah. shed some light on how you got into that. And, you know, what is your focus now as, you know, 
on the other side of it. Yeah. So um, after at literally two days after I, I walked on my own, mm -hmm. I woke up from a dream that said start a nonprofit. Um, okay. One nonprofit that was 2012. I had just graduated from um, college. Mm -hmm. And what was so crazy about it was when I had that, that when I woke up from that dream, one of the questions I always asked was why me? Like, why was I the one to get injured? Why did I have to suffer and go through the things that I was, I, I was going through? And in that moment, I realized that I was being prepared for something much greater. Mm -hmm. Like football, 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 you know, growing up in, in West Baltimore, it taught me something, right? Growing up in West Baltimore and going to a private school, all boys school, predominantly white school, it taught mm -hmm. me something. It was building me up along the way, the football. So, so reflecting back on it, everything that I was going through in for my upbringing, it was, everything was for a reason. Everything was for a reason. And so without any knowledge of a nonprofit, not knowing anybody who had a nonprofit since 2012. That's all I said. I've been, I've been every single day learning something new about nonprofits to, to continue to grow my nonprofit. Um, I started my nonprofit safe alternative foundation for education in 2012, mm -hmm. 2013. We started with one program, a six week flag football program. Um, but the whole purpose of it is to teach students the importance of having an education and a backup plan for life. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I wanted that was because when I was injured, I had nothing. Mm -hmm. I knew that there were two things that could never be taken away, no matter what my physical condition was. One was my education. One was the things that I was exposed to. As long as I had that education, I can teach somebody how to do some things. Mm -hmm. Right. The things that I was exposed to, I know, I know, it's, I know it's these things exist. And so because I know these things exist, I can strive for those things. Mm -hmm. And so I got to just continue to educate myself on how to get to those things. Because when you go to the school, you know, that school that I went to, you, you're seeing a little bit of everything. Right. Mm -hmm. When you when you come you're living in the hood, you're seeing everything that's there. But then when you go to other schools, when you're seeing the mansions and the big cars and the going home to doctors and lawyers and sign, like. Right. Right. I had the best of both worlds. So I knew what was there. So for me, it was, well, how can I bring those resources, opportunities, and that exposure to my community? Mm. How can I teach that to my kids? How can I bring an uh, how can I bring a private school education to my kids? Mm. And the reason I really wanted to do that was because I like I, I, I say this. I say a lot of people in my community and in communities like this are paralyzed. Mm. And they may not be paralyzed physically, but they're paralyzed mentally. So how can we unlock that, right? And the way that you unlock that is through education, through exposure. Again, when you know something exists, you can strive for it. Right. And so for us, it's how we, we connect the dots between the classroom and the real world. So how does what they're learning in the classroom apply to their life in the real world? Mm -hmm. An example uh, quickly would be like a woodshop program. We run, we've been running woodshop for a very long time. Since I started the program, Woodshop, it connects the dots between decimals, fractions, with mm -hmm. that they're learning in the classroom. So now they can see like, oh, this is how it applies. It's, right. teach it's teaching them a skill. It's fun. Plus, it's giving them insight into a career path that they can go, whether they go to college or not. That's mm -hmm. something that you can go into and make really good money. Right. So it's those kinds of things um, that we do. I just mentioned earlier before we got on, you know, went live about my summer camp. Mm -hmm. We travel so like we travel everywhere, anywhere we can get to. If we have the time, we're going to try to go because sometimes it's just the journey to getting to the location mm -hmm. that's extremely impactful. Right. We go to Eastern Shore every week. Driving over the Bay Bridge is extremely impactful for some kids who've never been out of a 10 block radius. Mm -hmm. And so it's those things that we do um, right now with with my nonprofit. Um, yeah. How can people, um, you know, get the information to support financially, follow you guys like before we, you know, ever get wherever we going? How, how can we do that? So our website um, and I encourage everyone, even if you don't donate, just go and check the website out. Um, it's www.safealternative.org. 
And then on uh, Instagram, Safe Alternative Foundation is the, is the Instagram name. And uh, we're we're a lot more active on like daily updates on, mm-hmm. on Instagram. Um, so you can see all the things that the kids are doing. But um, yeah, man, I, I, any support will help. And you've been to the space, so you, you, you yeah, 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 yeah. Uh- yeah, I see. I was on that on other, per, you know, my yeah. other side, <laughs> my yeah. other business that I that I do, um, and it was a, it was a good space. And, and just kind of seeing like how you how you you know making a multi year space, and just kind of hearing about the the after school program, and just kind of hearing like when we were sitting there just chatting, and, and he was like, mm-hmm. "How can I help you?" I was like, "Man," and I you know you just start telling me your story, and I was like, "This is perfect." Um, just because mm-hmm. I want definitely wanted to hear this story and just kind of you know link in and just kind of touch. Basis. Um, as a reference to the at school pr- program, how many kids do you service, and is it is it specifically for that community, or are you you know? So we 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 serve um, twenty students. Okay. And primarily, we we look for students from West Baltimore. Gotcha. If they are from the community, like majority of our students are from the community, mm-hmm. uh, we do have some students that that aren't in the immediate community. They might be in some of the surrounding communities. Yeah. Um, but you know, our, we, we barely have openings. They feel very fast when we do. Um, and the way our model is we, we recruit, we typically recruit students in the sixth grade okay. because our thing is we, we want them to stay with us for three years. Mm. And we say we're, we're, we, when I say it, we are truly a family, right? We're truly a family because for us, it's the reason why we really aim to keep our kids for three years, because sometimes in the sixth grade, there's just some things that we just have to instill in them. Mm-hmm. On top of just building that trust, right? In order for us to really get the best out of our kids, and this is anyone, you have they first have to trust you. Mm-hmm. So each each kid is different. Trust it varies. So once we get that trust, and they know, like, look, we genuinely here to help, support, whatever it may be. This is a safe space, and you can come and have a conversation with us about anything. Once we get through that, then we begin to really dive into that education piece, and you know, we we've. I want to share a story about one kid really quick. He came to me in the sixth grade and he's actually working with me this summer. Um, okay. He, but he came to me in the sixth grade in the first cohort of kids. And literally this was when I just opened this bad boy up. So I'm out here like, look, send me your kids, send me your kids, send me your kids. <laughs> They're like, man, what you doing with these kids down there, man? Look, just send it to me. We're going to figure it out. Like, we gonna Right. Work. But he came through that first cohort. And um, so he... Seventh grade year, I took him to Loyola. He told me he wanted to go to college there. And I was like, you can't. So he's all, you tell us we can do it. And I'm like, man, look, this is a middle and high school. So long story short, he says to me, I want to go to a private school for high school. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Bring me straight age, eighth grade year. I'll do everything in my power to get you into a, a, a high school, a private school. Gotcha. He was accepted into four. Mm-hmm. He chose Crystal Ray. Okay. Averaged a 4.3 GPA in the entire time there. Mm. Graduated salutatorian. He was accepted into 21 out of 23 colleges, over mm. 600,000 in scholarship money, and he's going down to Notre Dame. Sheesh. Right? So, <laughs> and that's just one. We had we have other students at Morgan. We have other students at private schools. Mm-hmm. Right. And so for us, we are literally holding them to a much higher expectation than what they're typically held at. Mm -hmm. And we're there to support them along that journey. And the bonds and the relationships that we're able to form because of that, um, that's why we're having success, right? And Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, give me your best kid, give me my best kid, give us a year to prepare, and I guarantee my kid will outwork and outperform your kid. Mm -hmm. Because I know that hustle and that grind that they have in them, and I'm gonna pull it out of them. It's I'm a gonna get it out. That, that's a dog. That's a yeah. dog in you there. Oh, I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man. I think I think that model is great. Um, the whole uh, keep them for three years. And I know you might have some that might fall in and fall out, but yeah, like yeah. and just kind of and stand with them for that three years because it's and and then the sixth grade is a very pivotal year. For them, when it comes to you know going to high school or you know setting themselves up for the future, so I think that's probably like the best. You know, I think that's a, a great model to, to keep, um, and I applaud you for that because 
getting them in that pivotal year and just kind of working with them and building that level of trust. And man, and most of the time, you know, their circumstances. So, you know, um, that family environment, that structure is what they need. Yep. It's just about having somebody that, that actually say, all right, I love you. I'm here for you. I'm going to support you and I'm going to discipline you too. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and, that, and that's what, and I think that's what makes the, 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 the more impactful relationships, um, in our lives when we, when we kind of, you know, have a, a long lasting relationship, not just something that lasts for, the, the 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 season but something that lasts for the year so you know that's i definitely appreciate that model i think it's a good model man man you know something that's i found that is very impactful like very impactful is for them to see an adult and a man apologize mm -hmm. like I, I i this just happened and it happens it happens at least once every cohort of students that i have like every year it happens where at times, I'll just I, I jump on somebody, but I was still like I'll jump on them, like jump mm -hmm. on. Them. And um, I jumped on a kid, like I I was on him, mm -hmm. and you know, let me find out otherwise. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like I'm on, <laughs> I'm on him, and so the, so I, of course I I I talk to who I need to talk to to find out what I need to find out, and they was like, no, nah, he he won, he they won him. Mm -hmm. I came back. And I publicly in front of everybody set them all down and apologized. Mm. And I told him, I said, I'm I'm doing this publicly. I could have did this, told him this by himself. I'm doing it publicly because I want y'all to understand that adults make mistakes as well. Mm. And adults, just because you're a child doesn't mean that an adult can't apologize to you. They've never said many of them, many of them have never seen that before. So it's, those, don't those see it. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's those kinds of things where it may seem small, but it's so impactful. The fact mm -hmm. that they know the leader of this organization is willing to apologize when he's wrong and apologize to a kid when he's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so then seeing my staff do those types of things as well, that's when you, you really can build those bonds, take those to another level. Because they know they can come and talk to you, and if you're wrong, you won't check yourself and you won't apologize. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, brother Brooks, man. You know, unapologetically, um, you you have survived uh, society stigmas, the standards, the systems, everything uh, more than the average person. What would you tell? the next brother that may not be exactly like you, but needs to overcome the same thing of, of these society stigmas, societal stigmas and standards and systems. What advice would you give the next brother, whatever the situation is? Oh man, that's, um, you know, that's, 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 that's a great question. Um, it's a hard question. And I have so many different answers, but I, I, I think I'm going to go with um, as long as you're doing things with good faith, doing things in good faith, right? Doing things in good faith. Um, someone's always going to be upset at something, no matter what it is that you do, right? But as long as you're doing things in good faith, um, they're ethical, and you're trying to help people, just go with it, man. Go with it. And 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 something that I struggle with of of at times in the beginning of like, how do I fit in with these things? Like, how do I fit in? Where do I fit in? But I found that I didn't have to try to fit in. If, if I was myself, people were going to match my energy and were going to naturally gravitate to me. And so whatever it is that you're going through, stay true to who you are. Do everything in good faith and um, just keep pushing through. Yeah. Every every week I get a word. <laughs> you know, every week I get a word because somebody's always, you know, like like they said in one of the movies, you be the hero long enough, you're gonna be the villain to somebody. Somebody gonna be mad at you for something, yeah. but you doing it with good faith, you know, you might have to apologize, but mm -hmm. you know, I always get the word on here, man. <laughs> get the word on here. There's always somebody speaking to me. <laughs> absolutely absolutely well, well van man i want to thank you for, again for just kind of sharing a few moments a few moments of your time just kind of share your story greatly appreciate it 
Um, and just kind of, you know, grateful that, you know, we connected on that day. I'm, I'm grateful that I signed up to be a, yeah. you know, to be a vendor at your event and just kind of meet you because, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have had the chance to kind of do this interview and kind of hear more of your story and, and what you went through. So once again, I want to applaud you and thank you for uh, joining us today. All right. I appreciate you. Thanks again for having me. Thank no you, problem. brother. Thank you All so right. much. All right. Once again, this is Unapologetic Black Male, where we uh, talk about surviving the stigma, standards, and systems, where we're celebrating um, African-American men and their stories to success. Listen, you can follow us on, on social media. Make sure you check out this week's episode um, on our podcast. Um, you can thank you to our sponsor. Thank you to our co-host, EJ. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great one. And thank you, brother. Peace.